First of all, you will need to place the bike on a stand. Barry is using a simple low cost alternative, a couple of car axle stands. Start by draining the engine oil. Remove the sump plug using a 17mm socket. The plug has a very low profile head so you may need to linish it down to fit the head of the plug snugly. Check the magnetic pickup for metal particles. Small amounts of fine particles are normal, but you should be concerned if larger particles appear in quantity. Next tap the filter cover to break any crystalline growth. Using a special spanner that can be simply made from a 27mm nut welded to a piece of flat bar, carefully loosen and remove the filter cover. Using a filter socket, loosen and remove the filter. You will note that the one Barry is using has two holes drilled in it. In the event that the old filter has been over tightened, causing the tool to round off the flats on the filter, a couple of self-tapping screws can be quickly inserted to provide better grip. Now loosen and remove the gearbox sump plug. Again, check the magnetic pickup for excessive metal particles. Finally remove the filler plug and then the drain plug on the bevel drive. Drain the oil and check the magnetic pickup. If you have a tap set available, it is a good idea to run the drain plugs through a 10 by 1.5 mm button die, as they have a tendency to stretch over time and can strip the threads in the castings. It's a good idea to write the details of the service, including date, oil type and mileage, on the filter for future reference, particularly if the bike is to be serviced by different people. Before installing the new filter, Partially fill it with oil to speed up oil pressure at startup. Remember too to lubricate the rubber seal on the face of the filter. Now carefully fit and spin on the filter by hand until it is firm. Using the filter tool and a wrench, the filter should now be tightened approximately three quarters of a turn. Before fitting the filter cover, lubricate the o-ring with some rubber grease. Then fit by hand and tighten until firm with our special tool. Before fitting the sump plug, check that the old crush washer isn't sitting in the recess. Now fit the sump plug, which should be fitted with a new crush washer. It's important to replace the crush washer at every service. A used crush washer is a crushed washer and may leak and assist in stripping threads by causing you to over tighten the plug. Tighten the plug until you feel the washer crush. Next refit the bevel drive drain plug. Again fit a new crush washer and tighten until you feel the washer crush. Finally fit a new crush washer to the gearbox drain plug and tighten. 
always use a quality brand of oil in the correct grade of SAE 8890 for both the gearbox and the bevel drive. Barry is using mobile synthetic gear lubricant. Never mix Molly Bond with ester based synthetic oils. However, it is recommended to do so with mineral oils. Fill the bevel with 250 millilitres of gear oil. An old baby's bottle is ideal for this task. Refit the filler plug and tighten. To make it easier to fill a gearbox, it's worth removing the right hand tank panel. Using an Allen wrench, remove the two screws, noting that the shorter of the two secures the front of the panel to the tank. Slip your fingers under the panel when the screws have been removed to gently lift the fingers on the back side of the panel from the grommets in the tank. Then pull the panel slightly to your right when removing to free it from the lug on the seat bodywork. Fill the gearbox with 750 millilitres of gear oil. Then fit and tighten the filler cap and finish off with the grommet. A good funnel makes pouring the engine oil a lot easier. Fill with 3.5 litres of good quality engine oil. The factory recommends a grade of SAE 2850. Barry is using Mobile One Racing Synthetic. When you are finished, check the dipstick for the correct level. The oil level should read slightly high due to the fact that the oil ways and filter are partially empty. To continue with our service, we must now remove the remaining side panel, seat and tank. Remove the two screws on the side panel, again noting that the shorter of the two secures the front of the panel to the tank. Slip your fingers under the panel when the screws have been removed to gently lift the fingers on the back side of the panel from the grommets in the tank. Then pull the panel slightly to your left when removing to free it from the stud on the seat bodywork. Next, using the key, unlock and remove the seat. Disconnect the two plugs on the left side of the tank connecting the low fuel warning light and the fuel tap from the wiring loom. The two plugs are identical, but you will notice that there are dark red markings on the ones for the fuel tap. Next, undo the hose clamp for the main fuel line and remove the hose using a pair of needle nose pliers. Repeat for the return line on the other side of the tank. Remove the bolt holding the tank in place. Now carefully lift the tank up and slip your hand in underneath to disconnect the breather hose located near the front of the tank before lifting clear. Remove the air box lid by undoing the two screws and disconnecting the hose to the air pressure sensor. Check the filter and replace if necessary. This particular filter should and will be replaced. Next place a cloth in the air box to stop foreign objects from disappearing down there during the service. Remove both plug leads. Remember to pull on the plug cap and not the lead when removing. If you have compressed air available, blow out the plug recesses to reduce the chance of debris falling into the combustion chambers when the plugs are removed. Now remove the two breather hoses. Undo the Allen screws holding each rocker cover on and lift the covers clear.
Remove the two spark plugs. This is a good point to check the condition of the plugs. Next remove the steering damper by undoing the two bolts that hold it in place. Now undo the six bolts holding the front engine mount in place, three on each side. Swing the engine mount out as far as it will go. There should be no need to remove any of the wiring, hoses or cables. Undo and remove the six Allen bolts holding the cam belt cover in place. Next, with a bit of wrangling, remove the cover. To correctly check the belt tension, we need to turn the engine over to top dead center on the firing stroke of the side being checked. Remove the plastic plug covering the flywheel inspection hole. Now using a screwdriver, turn the engine over to top dead center on the right hand side. A screwdriver placed in the plug hole can be used to determine how close you are. Just take care not to dislodge any carbon deposits inside the combustion chamber. Once you are close, check for markings through the inspection hole. You should see a horizontal line and a small letter D, which is the first letter of the Italian word for right. Then check that the valves are closed and that you are truly on the firing stroke. If not, you will need to turn the engine over another 360 degrees. Next, inspect the right hand belt for damage and that it has a free play of around 9mm. If not, you will need to adjust it. To adjust you will need to loosen the pivot bolt first and then the clamping bolt to move the idler pulley in or out to tighten or loosen the belt. Note that the clamping bolt has a nut on the reverse side of the cam belt housing. Take care not to over tighten the belt. As the engine warms up and expands, the centre distance between the pulley centres increases, tightening the belt further. If you don't feel confident about this task, leave it to a professional. Once you have checked the right hand belt, turn the engine over to top dead centre on the firing stroke for the left hand cylinder. This time you should see a small S through the inspection hole. Again inspect the belt for damage and that it has around 9mm of free play. If not, you will need to adjust it. When done, refit the cam belt cover. then bolt up the front engine mounts. Refit the steering damper, making sure it has equal free play at both right and left full lock of around 4mm. If the engine isn't still at top dead centre on the left side, Crank it over again until it is. Remember to check that the valves are closed on the left side and that a timing mark along with a small letter S can be seen through the inspection hole. Using a feeler gauge, check that the exhaust valves are set to a clearance of 0.15mm and that the inlets are set to 0.1mm. To adjust, loosen the lock nut and turn clockwise to tighten or anti-clockwise to loosen. Then re-tighten the lock nut before checking again. The feeler gauge should be firm but not too tight. When finished, turn the engine over again until the right hand side is at top dead centre on the firing stroke. Again check that the exhaust valves are set to a clearance of 0.15mm and that the inlets are set to 0.1mm. If not, you will need to adjust them using the same method used on the left side.
To get at the fuel filter, we need to first remove the lead to the engine temperature sensor. Next undo the two hose clamps. You may have to wait until the filter mounting bolts have been removed if one or the other isn't accessible. Remove the two bolts holding the filter in place, taking care not to lose the spaces located between the clamp. Now reverse the procedure and fit the new filter, making sure that you fit it in the correct direction of flow. Remember to reconnect the engine temperature sensor. Before replacing the plugs, it is a good idea to gap them first. The Centero is fitted with NGK DR9EA spark plugs and a recommended gap is 0.7mm. If available, brush on some anti-seize compound before fitting. Then screw them in by hand, being careful not to cross-thread them. Finally tighten with a wrench until you feel the plug washers crush. There is no need to over tighten. Barry recommends replacing the inner o-rings before refitting the rocket covers as they can weep oil. Then refit the left hand rocket cover replacing bolts and tighten. Refit breather hose and clamp and repeat for the right side. Reconnect plug leads on both sides. and cable tie the leads to the breather hoses. Finally, refit the inspection bung on the right side. To adjust the steering head bearings, we must first loosen the top triple clamp, starting with the two pinch bolts that hold the fork legs in place. Now remove the cap from the center bolt and undo the pinch bolt. Then loosen the main steering head bolt. Tap the assembly to free it and we are now ready to adjust the tension on the steering head bearings. Using a special wrench, tighten the steering head using just one finger. This will give just the right amount of preload on the bearing, approximately 8 to 12 inch pounds of torque. When done, retighten all the bolts in the reverse order. Finish off by refitting the decorative cap. Now it's time to refit the air cleaner element. Next tighten the two retaining bolts. Then refit the hose running to the air pressure sensor. To get easy access to the front two grease nipples on the drive shaft, we need to remove the rear bodywork. Undo the six bolts and lift it away. To gain access to the front grease nipples, Rotate the wheel until they are facing upwards. This allows vertical access to the frontmost one through a hole in the swing arm. Do not over lubricate or force grease through the seals quickly. The grease nipple on the rear uni joint can be accessed from below. Rotate the wheel if required. Finish off by refitting the rear bodywork. Whilst the front brake pads can be checked without removing, we'll remove them to show you how it's done. 
Remove the clip on the retaining pin. Using a pin punch, knock out the pin and remove. Remove the spring plate and lift out the two pads using a screwdriver. The groove cut in the centre of each pad is the wear indicator and the pads should be replaced when they near the bottom of this groove. If you are going to replace the pads, you can use a pair of circlip pliers to seat the caliper pistons before removing them. Note that you may have to lower the fluid level in the master cylinder first to prevent it from overflowing. When refitting, note that the spring plate has an arrow indicating the direction of rotation. Next refit the pin and tap home. Finally insert the clip on the rear of the pin. Whilst the rear caliper is slightly different, the pads are removed in a similar manner by removing this pin. From the rear you can also see the wear indicator on the left hand pad. To replace the brake fluid first remove the master cylinder cover. Next lift off the cap taking the rubber bellows inside with it. Take care not to spill any fluid. Using a syringe, remove as much brake fluid as possible from the master cylinder. Refill using DOT3 or DOT4 brake fluid from a new sealed container. Attach a bleed line to the bleed nipple on the right caliper and run it to a waste fluid container. Next, whilst placing light pressure on the brake lever, open the bleed nipple. Now pull the lever slowly into the handlebars. Take care as fluid can spurt from the master cylinder if you pull too quickly. Close the bleed nipple and gently release the brake lever. Wait a moment before repeating to allow the system to recover. On average, you will need to repeat this operation eight times for each side. Keep an eye on the fluid level and top up when required. Now repeat the procedure for the left hand side. Remember to check the fluid level in the master cylinder as you go. Finish off by topping up the master cylinder and replacing the cap. This is also a good point to lubricate the brake and clutch levers. Use a good quality lubricant. Barry is using Worth HHS 2000. Bleeding the rear brake is as straightforward as the front. First syringe out as much old fluid as you can. Then top up the master cylinder with fresh brake fluid. Attach a bleed line to the bleed nipple on the caliper and run it to a waste fluid container. Whilst placing light pressure on the brake lever, open the bleed nipple. Push the lever slowly all the way down. Close the bleed nipple and gently release the brake lever. Wait a moment and then repeat. You will need to perform this cycle around 8 times. Remember to check the fluid level in the master cylinder as you go. Finish off by topping up the master cylinder and replacing the cap. Next lubricate the brake lever pivots, wiping up any excess. Repeat on the other side for the gear change lever. And not forgetting the side stand pivot. Next check the tyre pressures. The factory recommended settings are 2.2 bar or around 32 psi for the front and 2.4 bar or around 35 psi for the rear without a passenger. Most owners run a few psi above these settings generally, but the optimum setting will vary depending on tyre choice, rider weight and the type of riding you do. Before refitting the tank, apply a little rubber grease on the front mounting rubbers. Next place the tank roughly into position before reaching underneath to refit the drain tube. Now seat the front of the tank into the mounting rubbers. Slip a piece of wood under the rear mount to give easy access to the wiring for the fuel tap and low fuel warning light. Reconnect both plugs remembering that the fuel tap leads have dark red ends on them.
Carefully work the fuel hose on and tighten its clamp. Repeat for the return line on the other side. Replace and tighten the tank mounting screw. We will now check the throttle body balance. Connect your balance gauges to both manifolds. For a more in-depth adjustment of the fuel injection system, see part 2 of this service video. Start and run the engine for a while to warm it up. Check that the oil pressure light has gone out. Using the adjustment knob located on the left hand side of the throttle linkage, adjust for the best compromise balance at 2000, 3000 and 4000 RPM. Take care to allow for the rocking of the right hand ball joint as this can affect the balance setting. When you are happy, disconnect the balance gauges and refit the manifold screws. Finally, refit the remaining bodywork. First apply some rubber grease to the side panel retaining grommets on both sides of the fuel tank. Carefully locate the left side panel on the lug located on the rear bodywork before gently pushing the panel's retaining fingers into the grommets located in the tank. Refit the two retaining bolts noting that the shorter of the two holds the panel to the fuel tank. Repeat the operation on the right side. Finish the service off by checking that all the lights are working properly. Now take the bike for a short ride around the block to check for oil leaks and any tuning problems. Before we get any further into the setup of the fuel injection system on the Centaro, it would be worth having a quick run through on how it works. You can see from the diagram that the injection system consists of several interconnected components. Central to its operation is the Weber Morelli Electronic Control Unit or ECU. This is the brains of the system and its job is to collect information from the various sensors to determine the spark and fuel requirements of the engine at any given RPM or throttle position. The ECU is located at the rear of the bike under the seat. There are three environment sensors linked to the ECU. The first is the air temperature sensor which is located behind the front right hand indicator. The second is the air pressure sensor which is located under the tank and connected to the air box by a tube. The third is the engine temperature sensor. This is located on the left side of the right hand cylinder head. The two remaining sensors are the throttle position sensor or TPS and the RPM sensor. The RPM sensor is located between the left hand cam belt tunnel and the left hand cylinder and uses a gap toothed wheel set behind the lower cam belt pulley to determine top dead centre and engine RPM. The throttle position sensor is fitted to the right hand throttle body and works very much like the volume control on your stereo. The remaining parts of the injection system consist of the fuel circuit and the ignition system. Apart from the ECU, the ignition system is pretty standard fare really and uses two coils and one plug for each cylinder. The Centaro uses a fuel pump feeding through a large fuel filter to supply the two injectors at a constant pressure of 3 bar or 42 psi. A return line to the tank via a pressure regulator maintains a constant pressure in the fuel system. As a side note, it's important to replace the fuel filter at regular intervals as it can greatly affect fuel pressure and flow and therefore overall performance. The ECU regulates the fuel supplied to the engine by varying the duration of the electrical pulses sent to each injector. When the throttle is opened and the engine revs, these pulses become wider each cycle injecting more fuel into the engine. If we take a look inside the rubber bung on the ECU, you will note that there is a removable EEPROM chip and a trim pot. The trim pot is used to richen or lean the entire fuel map to set the optimum CO level of around 4% when tuning. Turning the screw anti-clockwise richens the mixture whilst clockwise leans it. 
The EEPROM holds the fuel and spark maps used by the ECU and can be changed out for other EEPROMs containing modified or alternative maps. The maps are in the form of tables and provide an array of values to the ECU for each given RPM and throttle position. The first is the main fuel map. The vertical axis shows throttle position in degrees, whilst the horizontal represents RPM. These particular tables are from a custom map installed in MyChintaro. The next table contains fuel data for the second cylinder. Instead of storing a full set of values here, this map consists of plus or minus offsets relative to the main fuel map. These values can vary by up to 20%. The third table contains the spark map and lists the amount of ignition advance required for throttle position versus RPM. The final trim tables are used to correct for various operating conditions that include air density, air and engine temperature. Now it's time to get our hands dirty and start the actual process of tuning the injection system. First of all you will need to remove the seat and both side panels. Note that the shorter side panel screws are used to secure the panels to the fuel tank. Next use a screwdriver to pop the throttle cross shaft off the right hand throttle body. Make sure that the fast idle lever on the handlebar is off and loosen the fast idle lever screw to allow it to move freely. Wind the right hand throttle stop screw out, seen here with an allen key in it, so it's clear when the blade is shut. Pull back the cover on the TPS connector and insert short wires into the left hand and centre pins. Next, set your multimeter to a range suitable for measuring hundreds of millivolts and attach the positive lead to the left hand wire and the negative to the center. Check that the throttle blade is snapping all the way closed. Turn on the ignition. Check the voltage. You should be seeing 150 millivolts with the throttle closed. If not, you will need to loosen the two screws on the TPS unit and adjust it. Turn the TPS unit anti-clockwise to increase the voltage and clockwise to reduce it. Only minor adjustments should be required, so take it slowly and carefully. When done, tighten the screws, check the voltage and readjust if required. The reason we need to set the TPS to exactly 150 millivolts is that the ECU uses this voltage to determine the throttle's position in degrees. 150 millivolts equals zero degrees or throttle closed. Now set the idle by screwing the right hand throttle stop screw in to set the voltage to 378 millivolts. This is the factory idle setting and whilst you will have to set it higher later, this is a good starting point. Now wind out the left hand throttle stop screw. Reconnect the throttle linkage using a pair of pliers. Screw the air bleed screws located underneath both throttle bodies clockwise until they are all the way in. Connect your balances to both manifolds. Start and run the engine for a while to warm it up. Using the adjustment knob located on the left hand side of the throttle linkage, adjust for the best compromise balance at 2000, 3000 and 4000 RPM. Take care to allow for the rocking of the right hand ball joint as this can affect the balance. When the engine is fully warmed up, set the idle speed to between 1000 and 1100 RPM using the left hand throttle stop screw. Now set the idle balance by opening the air bleed screw on the cylinder with the highest vacuum. Recheck and if required adjust the idle speed using the left hand throttle stop. Setting the idle balance will affect running balance somewhat, but be careful not to get too carried away trying to get both perfect, as you will find yourself in a never-ending circle. If you have access to a gas analyzer, set the idle mixture to a CO level of between 3.5 and 4.5%. Adjust the trim pot located under the rubber bung on the ECU unit clockwise to lean the mixture and anti-clockwise to richen. Be careful not to apply too much pressure on the trimmer as it is possible to damage it if you force it past its end stop. 
If you don't have access to a gas analyzer, you can use Brad's quick and dirty method which is surprisingly accurate once you get the feel for it. Whilst the engine is running, turn the trimmer clockwise to the full lean position. Now turn anti-clockwise until the idle starts to smooth out. Mark this position on the case. Next turn the trimmer anti-clockwise to the full rich position. Now turn clockwise until the idle again starts to smooth out. Mark this position on the case. Divide the difference between the two positions into thirds and set the trimmer to the first division on the right side, or lean end. The CO level should now be close to the desired level of 4%. Next check and reset the idle speed as it may have changed after the mixture adjustment. Follow this with another mixture check and so on until you are happy with both the idle speed and mixture. Then set and re-tighten the fast idle lever screw with a little clearance. Refit the ECU plug and tape over to prevent dirt and moisture entering the case. Finally, refit the side panels and seat and take the bike for a test ride.